And now I'd like to welcome you to today's webinar on leadership and development, thinking with critical insight. I'm going to hand things over to our featured presenter today. He is executive leadership coach and professional development consultant, Mr. Tom Bohens. Tom, you now have the floor. Thank you. Um, so welcome. I see there's almost 200 people here. It's uh, it's amazing. I can kind of feel the energy of the curiosity that that brings. And I don't really know who's in the audience and what the background is, but I'm assuming there's already a lot of wisdom and knowledge about this topic that I think is very compelling, critical thinking. Um, if you, I like to talk about it as the whole of critical thinking because it's really a set of capabilities. And this set of capabilities is really very necessary to our success, both as individuals and professionals and executives and leaders, but also to our teams, our companies, and to our community. So thank you for having me and welcome. Uh, Bluff, uh, I do a lot of work with the military in various ways, and there's a, a, a communication principle in, in some of the military that they call Bluff, which is bottom line up front. And it's uh, really a very simple thing. It's the preference that you start with your conclusion and then follow it up with the supporting facts around your conclusion. So that's kind of what I do today and it serves as our agenda. These six things are the, the dimensions of critical thinking that we're gonna cover very briefly today. So it's, first of all, it's the language. What does the language really mean? And, and it's for the real world and people. Just what I mean there is that in order for people to agree on what's expected to hold each other accountable to to see about what new new directions they might go in they have to be able to articulate it and so this gives language across a lot of different categories uh, hopefully we'll communicate the value of this uh, skill set to you today as well we want to talk about what its process characteristics are and we, we think of it as a dual process which means that it, it that it flows linearly a b and c but it also doesn't flow linearly, it flows organically and it hits reciprocal. So you might go A to B to C and decide that, hey, I gotta go back to A or you know, it's, it's very organic while it has a structure at the same time. So the process part of it is twofold, a dual process. Uh, mindset is something that we think of as a key component to being a effective critical thinker. We'll spend some time on that and some examples of mindsets that are valuable in the critical thinking process. There's a couple pieces of knowledge that we think that are important to execute the process well. For example, knowledge about bias is one of the things we'll talk about. And we'll talk about a few of those today. And finally, there's just a few techniques that we think are useful for critical thinking, for leading a critical thinking or participating in critical thinking, especially if you're working in a group setting. Um, so we only have this 45 minutes and I hope that we can sharpen your grasp and solidify your commitment to critical thinking during that time. So today, we uh, this morning actually, I was just talking to someone and I was reminding them that learning, I mean, training or a webinar is an event, but learning is a process. So today we'll cover some terms and co concepts. We'll have a little Q and A, and I'll I'll try to play both question and answer there during when I can, but. You know, your ability to apply these things to business specific situations or organization specific situations and your ability to challenge your thinking and, and really, you know, once you're once you figure you have something set out to come up with a contrast and be able to reconcile those differences, that type of learning is uh, beyond what we can do in 45 minutes. And it's uh, something I encourage you to take uh, this new sense of how big critical thinking is and to follow up with some activities. So our, this is basically represents one of three parts. So we really kind of have three segments today. So play a little bit with critical thinking, what a definition is, and then talk about a little bit about our modern challenges and why uh, critical thinking might be important. So critical thinking, what I really want you to think of here is uh, critical thinking as two things, our perspective. It's uh, a complex set of processes or capabilities that doesn't mean it's complicated, it's just that it's multifaceted. And it's also a global set of capabilities. And by that we mean it, it isn't just designed for one context or one setting, it's a skill set that has utility 
it can play all the positions on the team, so to speak, in, in many different ways. So it's a skill that, it's not a narrow skill, it's a general skill. Um, some of the, uh, some of the um, common ideas we might have about what critical thinking is, it's one of those uh, ideas that we use the term and it makes sense to us, but we, we're, it's a little bit soft around the edges in terms of our pinning down what it is. And a lot of us commonly would think of it as, well, it's well-considered thinking, or it's well-judged processes, or it's uh, something that's scaled and focused very well, or it's problem solving, or if you're a product designer, maybe it's good design. These are all kind of synonyms for critical thinking. And the good news is that um, all of those are true. You're all right, uh, because critical thinking is what we call a high order skill versus a more concrete skill. So this little diagram that we have on our screen, this is um, based on Bloom's taxonomy, which a lot of you have, I'm sure, heard about. And it's the idea that there, that there are simple things like we learn in elementary school uh, that are really basically the accumulation of facts and understanding you know, what those facts are and being able to like, basic comparison. So we might know what a dog is and we might be able to recognize a dog and we might be able to compare different types of dogs and recognize different types of dogs and compare them to other animals. Um, but it's critical thinking isn't so straightforward. It isn't so simple because it's a high order uh, skill. It requires um, some some effort to integrate it and to make sense out of it and to and to actually uh, uh, integrate kind of the whole depth of the whole range of what critical thinking is. I, I like to compare it to, to like an iceberg, if you can imagine an iceberg. And a lot of the kind of our streetwise, off the cuff thinking, critical thinking is maybe just, you know, what's oh, a logical argument. It, and it is, um, but it's also more than that, but from beneath the surface. So this is the definition that I would like us to use. And Kelly, excuse me while I try to close this screen so I can read my own screen. There we go. Okay. so. Um, this is my definition, but it's built, uh, it's borrowed from some other folks' materials to a certain extent. But um, it's a global capability, so it means just a combination of practices, mindsets, and awareness, of, you know, knowledge and capability that is used in many situations and skill areas. So we just don't do critical thinking. We use critical thinking to do things. So we might use it for decision making or problem solving. We might use it for recruiting. We might use it for our ethics and compliance types of questions. So there's on the right hand side of the screen, there are all uh, situations or contexts that we would use this global capability in. So is, is it, uh, that's, that's the definition of critical thinking for starting. So is it valuable? There's an important question. So you may already hold a strong uh, specific conviction that this is valuable, that this is important, or others um, may have some little more of a curiosity about it, but they're not convinced. So um, what we want to find out is um, a little bit more about how you might find this valuable. And we're going to tee this off of an audience poll. Kelly, that's your cue. Am I online? Yes, I'm sorry. It took me a while to unmute. So the poll is live now. So if you all can uh, please make your selection. All right, so we got the majority of the people voted, so let's go ahead and see those results. Still collecting responses. All right, so we got about, let's see, I can go ahead and share this. There we go, there are the results. Hmm. 
I don't see them, Kelly. Okay, so we have about 54% in we get bogged down in detail, 67% there is conflict when there should be collaboration, 42% we have less routine and more exceptions, and 53% we want both quality and agility, and 49%, we have imperfect information. It's pretty even across the board. Yeah, it is, and I, I, I confess that I would expect that all of these things are um, challenges that most of us have in organizations. And the case I'll make, and we'll try to re rebuild it at the end, is that all of these things are affected by uh, or helped by uh, the, the whole of critical thinking. So, for example, getting bogged down in detail, if that's something that happens to us, one of the skills of critical thinking is to be able to filter out what is unnecessary or irrelevant in terms of facts and to uh, get past some bias that might drive us into a lot of detail. So it's not like there's a magic wand that once you understand these things, you won't get bogged down in detail, but it does give you this, the, a little bit more certainty about which whether to be patient with that or when to shift that. And really importantly, it gives you language and gives your team language to, to bring this up and open this up as a point of conversation in a way that's uh, 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 engaging for the team. So let's go look at, can I have my screen back now, Kelly? Yeah, you should be able to move forward now. Perfect. Um, okay, so besides these kind of current challenges, and these are just examples that we had from the poll of things that we deal with now on a daily basis that critical thinking can help us with. Besides that, there's these future challenges that I think we may not realize are on the horizon. So I wanted a couple quotes that I have here that I wanted to share that tee this up very nicely. So they're from the World Economic Forum report on the future of jobs. Uh, this is a think tank. It included, I think, 50 or so um, uh, human resources uh, uh, strategists from different companies that you would all know. So artificial intelligence and machine learning and 3D printing and et cetera, et cetera, will cause widespread disruption, not only to the business models, but also to labor markets with enormous change predicted in the skill sets needed to thrive in the new landscape. Many formerly purely technical occupations, these are examples, are expected to show new demand for creative and interpersonal skills, cognitive abilities and process skills, such as creativity, mathematical reasoning, active listening, and critical thinking, will be growing part of the core skills requirement for many industries. So there's actually an, another slide I did have in here that, that ranked the top 10 skills that uh, this group of people felt were going to be in demand in another decade. And critical thinking, I think, was number three. So here's the idea. Will your capabilities keep pace? So the blue line on the screen, this is, this is like over time from now to the future or from the past to the future, uh, what the challenges are of your job. And let's assume they're going up because you're a professional and you're getting more responsibility and uh, your job is changing and so your challenges are going to go higher. But you know, thinking of the World Economic Forum and what they call the Fifth Industrial Revolution, uh, it's also going to be that the world is more complex. Uh, machines and artificial intelligence and tools like that will do a lot of the routine of our jobs and we'll be left with the more uh, complicated pieces and the exception pieces. So not only will our job change because our role is changing and we're progressing, our, the world is going to get uh, more complicated. So uh, that line goes up. So the question then is, will your capabilities, technical skill, domain knowledge, high order thinking like critical thinking and leadership skills, will those keep pace with your challenges? So uh, borrowing from Mihail Chris Mahali, Chris Mahali, I'm probably the name wrong in his idea of flow, uh, applies to this because if our challenges are less than our capabilities where the red arrow is pointing, uh, we are frustrated and bored. If the challenges are higher than our capabilities, then we have fear and anger and we have performance issues. So the sweet spot where we have flow is where our capabilities match our challenges and we could muster everything we have to, to address them and those things match up. So the, the challenge on uh, critical thinking is if critical thinking is in increasing demand as we move up, 
And if critical thinking is an increasing demand as the world changes, where are we now on that green line and what do we need to do to build those capabilities? What, what capabilities do we need? Uh, okay, now we're going to get to critical thinking, but before we get there, I want to repeat what we just, what I just said in a little bit more succinct way and build an argument. What critical thinking would say is building an argument. So given that we have challenges today, we'll have more challenges tomorrow, and this, this skill set is seen as, as a critical part of our performance, given those three premises and those three facts and assumptions, it follows that it's valuable to me to master these high order capabilities. Okay, a little bit now about um, what the mechanics of critical thinking are. So remember we talked at the, in, the, in the agenda portion that there's some process involved and it's a, it's a two part process or a two order process. So there, there is a start, a middle and a conclusion. And the start is where we're identifying what the problem is, uh, we're we're, we're uh, gathering information that is our facts that are really relative to the problem and we're discarding information that's not. The middle is our processing it internally, our thinking through it and our reacting to it and, and, and being uh, honest brokers of that information and making relationships and then doing that with other people that are part of our team. And the conclusion then is drawing a consensus or a conclusion of, of from that follows from the facts that we had established. And so at that simple level, critical thinking is just pick a problem and gather information, uh, process and assess that information, draw a conclusion. Uh, if you have to go back and start again or go back to the middle again, you do that, that iterativeness. Uh, People, a guy named Dewey is a researcher, spent his whole life on critical thinking. Critical thinking is one of those problems that is so rich for him that he spent his whole career studying it. He's a very traditional guy. And he says, the steps of critical thinking are just as we did, the blue ones. Identify a situation, form a central topic. Series of inquiries, collect fact, mental reasoning. Form and test a hypothesis. I guess it unstated there is draw a conclusion. But others uh, have said that it isn't always that linear, right? Real problems in the real world are more organic. They're moving targets. They're complicated. It's not like I, I have some overly simplistic problem. A lot of business problems and a lot of technical problems are really significant. And so critical thinking is also this organic and recursive process. A couple other researchers have come up with these definitions of what the process is. Two Chinese researchers, again, their focus is on critical thinking uh, from Hong Kong University. Uh, they say that critical thinking, the process of critical thinking is just a checklist of capabilities that can be used in a variety of orders that selectively, you don't have to use them all, don't have to go through each step, and you can use them more than once or not at all, basically, right? So here's their list, observing, feeling, wondering, imagining, inferring, knowing, experimenting, consulting, arguing, judging, deciding, some of those things go exactly with traditional ideas of critical thinking. Some of them are more broad. Stanford University study. Uh, they took a study, they did a really great study. Um, uh, there are about a half a dozen uh, recognized psychological tests that they use in assessment of your abilities for like promotions and executive hiring and stuff like that that are around critical thinking capability. So they took those half dozen tests and they took a set of who they identified as the, the leading uh, philosophers and management uh, thinkers, academics around what critical thinking meant. And they, they did a big compare and contrast and they whittled it down to these capabilities. So they say critical thinking is observation, emotional strength, questioning, imagination, inference, experimenting, consulting, argument analysis, meaning the logical analysis of making an argument, like we've done a couple times here, judging and deciding, identifying assumptions, constructing definitions, social collaboration, because problems are too complex to understand it by one person, domain knowledge, and maturity. And by maturity, they mean the ability to, um, to stay rational and objective in, in the face of uh, you know, bias and conflict.
I just want to recap real quickly. Uh, so far, we said uh, critical thinking is a higher order capability. It's used, it's a high utility uh, global capability. It means it's used in many situations. It's, it's not something you do, it's something you use. And it's both a linear process and not a linear process at the same time. So we're gonna go a little bit more about some of the characteristics of critical thinking. And one of them is mindset. And that basically means there's the, the mindset that you bring to the critical thinking process has a big impact on how good of a critical thinker you are. Now, there's probably some of the 100, some 200 people on the call um, who already appreciate that mindset is a, is a powerful part of performance. Others of you may think it's a little too new age guru-ish or just may not have figured out exactly what people mean when they say those things. But the evidence is really clear that what happens in our inner game affects our outer game. Athletes talk about this all the time. Coaches talk about this all the time. High achievers, you go listen to, you know, Steve Jobs talk about what really drives him. He talks about what's going on inside as well. So the, the mental capacity, the, the, the per mental perspective that you bring has an impact on whether or not you are going to be effective in your critical thinking process. So we're just going to look at a few of them real quickly. Again, we're on a short time leash here. So one, don't jump to conclusions. So go with the open mindset of saying, I'm, I'm going to I'm going to defer making a judgment and I'm going to listen. So people often make conclusions before they have all the facts. This is actually a natural reaction that you should be self-aware about. It, it, you know, if you think about it in terms of needing to make a quick judgment from a, a fight or flight or a survival standpoint, we see something, we make a judgment about it. So that, that's great if we're trying to survive, <laughs> but it's not necessarily great if we're trying to do critical thinking type things. So we have to defer judgment. So it's an important set, step to take the time to acquire the necessary and sufficient information for your problem. Be mindful of the dynamics that are going on there. And as you assess your facts, consider if you have what you need to make a conclusion and communicate it. Open-mindedness means being willing to take evidence or arguments that may cause you to revise your current understanding. So open-minded doesn't mean you, you're not specific about what you're thinking about, but you're willing to take in a different opinion or look at information that might disrupt the path that you're on currently. So you concede that there may be something relevant that you do not know, and you suspend bias and prejudgment about it. Curiosity is a companion to open-mindedness a virtue by which we learn. So being curious is not just accepting new information, it's proactively exploring what you do not have knowledge of, but suspect may be relevant. So normally we like to say, we'll just solve this problem based on what our current knowledge base is, but sometimes we can follow our instincts and say, I, follow our instincts and curiosity and go somewhere that we haven't figured out yet. You know, I, maybe we should talk to this person because this seems like this is relative to it. Let's learn what they have to say about this, what their perspective is. And then the last mindset here is um, about perspective, changing your perspective. So uh, an alternate perspective is an act of open-mindedness and curiosity. Uh, what, you know, what alternative perspectives might you take? I'm reading the slide here, obviously, but this means, so you might wanna look at a problem from your customer's perspective, for example, or your coworkers or your stakeholders, you know, all the people that are involved or are gonna be affected by this, taking the time to look at what the facts are and what's necessary and sufficient or relevant around this topic from all those perspectives can very much open up your, your, your uh, questions about what the facts are. And, and, you know, and those new perspectives may confirm what you're already thinking or, or they may disrupt your analysis and your conclusions. And the one specific one here is the future, looking at something from the future perspective is actually, you know, how will this look five years down the road? It's a very uh, powerful perspective to take. Uh, so putting this all together, this is our last segment. And, uh, but it's still a good bunch of stuff here. So in this last segment, there's completing the puzzle we've already kind of defined what we think critical thinking is. Uh, we've already talked about what its value is today and in the future. We talk about the steps, the, the, pro, the dual process, the two-part process. We talk about mindsets that can 
amplify our ability to be a critical thinker. And so we just have seven more things to complete the puzzle. It's two more puzzle pieces. There's five bits of knowledge that come in handy and are essential to the critical thinking process. And it's two techniques that you can use, especially in group settings, to help uh, move the processes along or improve its quality. So one, we have to have a countdown, one to, one to seven. <clears throat> Nest, the concept of necessary and sufficient. So necessary and sufficient, it's really kind of an easy concept that's sometimes hard to communicate. My own observation in the real world of working is that um, it often doesn't come up in, in conversations, people kind of bypass it. So knowing that it's there, uh, having everybody clear on the terminology can really sometimes help people again, raise the goal. So let me try to illustrate what this is. So I don't, uh, rather than the picture that you see on the screen, I need you to use your imagination. Imagine that you've got a goal or a business problem and you've got a whiteboard and that you've had a brainstorming session and there's post-its all over the place. People have clustered them into, into categories and you've got this huge set of post-its. Now next to that is a blank whiteboard. So now you ask the question of all the stuff on the whiteboard, which ones are necessary to complete the goal? Which ones are, are non-negotiable to complete the goal? So looking at the picture on the screen, it could be you got these seven things in the guy's head and you ask the question, which ones are necessary to complete the goal? And it's, well, there's only three of them there. The others are inconsequential or, you know, maybe they're, they're, they're not strong candidates anyway. So narrowing it down to what's necessary makes your thinking sharper, makes your communication sharper and makes your assessment of do all these facts eventually lead to a conclusion makes it much clearer for you. So the second step is you're looking at the right hand board that has the, just the essential things or the we'll use the picture on the screen, the three dots. You look at that and you say, is anything missing? And, and that's when you're trying to discern, are, are those three dots sufficient? So necessary means that it actually uh, is related to the conclusion you're trying to reach or the question you're asking. And the is it sufficient is do we, do we have enough to reach the goal? I had a really good example, in it, but I've now forgotten what it was to make that even clear. But if that's not clear, ask again later on in our Q&A. I hope it's clear. Okay, two, logical argument. This is what a lot of people think of as um, uh, critical thinking, meaning uh, rational formula, logical formula, rhetorical uh, formulas. Uh, this is, in fact, a big part of critical thinking. Uh, it's just the work of, of getting all your... Uh, um, premises and your facts and your uh, assumptions is more than just then processing what those assumptions are. So uh, if, if I was picking a graphic now, I might do it the other way because your, your facts are probably M and C squared, right? So your, your argument is if M or given M and given C squared, then we get E, right? That's your log logical argument. And, uh, so you can... Um, you can spend whole classes, you can spend whole semesters, you can write, you can go forever at the kind of the technical formulas of logical arguments, and that is time well spent if that helps you process them. But I really, today, and for a baseline, would say, just be prepared to know that your premises, your assumptions, and your facts should lead logically to your conclusion. And there's a term called non sequitur that many people have heard. It comes up on the news a lot, or you're reading a book, or occasionally in a, you know, it's a big debate scene on your movie, right? But uh, a lot of people don't remember what non sequitur means, and I have to sometimes stop and look it up, or I used to, now I know what it means. But uh, it really means that your conclusion does not logically follow from your facts. So non sequitur means that if, if given A and given B, you claim Z, you could say, no, that doesn't make sense. If I have A and B, it doesn't make sense to me that I'm going to therefore conclude Z, right? So uh, it, it's an important, not that you should use that kind of snobby word in, in, in public, but you should understand the idea that the conclusion should flow naturally from the facts. And if it doesn't, it really means a couple of things. One, you, your facts aren't wrong. It, they're incomplete. You don't have all the necessary facts. They're insufficient. Uh, well, the facts are wrong. You may have facts that aren't that you may you may you may have a fact that isn't necessary, or so it's a kind of a red herring. They're not sufficient. You don't have all of them, 
or sometimes it's it's uh, really the next topic, which is assumptions are there that are unstated. So lots of times the facts are easier to see, the assumptions are harder to see, or they're left they're either hidden or they're left unstated. And so another thing to be aware of uh, in terms of being an effective critical thinker is that assumptions are important, and they're important to build your argument, but they're also important to communicate. Uh, your argument both within your team and after the team. Uh, if you have a stronger communication of your argument, if you articulate what the assumption is, it gives people a chance to question them. Uh, it grounds you more in the reality. Um, it's really helpful to get that feedback during this process because it may improve your critical thinking, but it's also just smart in terms of how a, kind of a canary in the cage as to how people are going to react to the thinking and the message. So that, because what you don't want to do is bring forth a conclusion that kind of doesn't hold up or is missing uh, enough information for people to actually buy into. So if you're a big boss, you, uh, people will pay attention, but those questions will still be uh, lingering in the background and they'll end up either your support will dwindle or you'll get some resistance. So assumptions is a really important thing to remember. Am I getting the assumptions clear? Here we go with cause number four, cause versus correlation. Uh, correlation, I think most people understand, is a statistical relationship, right? So it's a statistical, a strong statistical relationship that's either positive or negative. So positive correlation means if, if ice cream is going up, then violent crime is going up. Negative correlation means if ice cream is going up, positive or violent crime is going down. So uh, the so be clear on kind of what the basics of correlation are, but also um, I think anybody that's taken the statistics class will recognize that uh, uh, correlations aren't necessarily causal, right? So you can have a really high correlation, but you have to make sense out of does that seem like an, it's an indicator of a cause that you can predict that going forward. And so if you've observed this correlation, and then watched it in real life and seen that real life supports it, that's a stronger fact than maybe just getting some new data or some new analysis, which hasn't been maybe tested with the reality. Uh, I'll leave it at that for right now. But um, a cute story on the ice cream and the crime, maybe some of you know this. Uh, there was a study done in, about New York violent crime in the 70s. And um, they tried to find out what the causes were using statistics, this newfangled thing, and they found out that the highest correlation between violent crime was the sale of ice cream. So on that example, you can see it's pretty ridiculous to think the sale of ice cream has anything to do with crime, but it is an example where sometimes the numbers don't actually tell a reasonable story. And uh, uh, real quickly too, the, the way uh, to think about some of this is sometimes it's the way around. Maybe ice cream didn't cause the crime, Maybe crime caused the ice cream. In that case, it's probably not a good, a, a good judgment, right? But it could be that logically. Uh, a, a more likely one is both ice cream and crime are caused by something else. A and B is caused by C. And in, in this case, that is the situation that they were both uh, highly correlated with the weather. <laughs> so hot weather uh, shorten people's temper, more violent crime. Hot weather motivated people to go buy ice cream. Interesting. So it could just be that the correlation is a coincidence. There's, it, it, sometimes that happens. Things are happening together for no apparent reason. Uh, and uh, uh, those are all things to consider uh, uh, when, uh, when someone presents you with some evidence. This is kind of similar to um, you know, uh, uh, algorithm output, right? The algorithms are only accurate for what they were designed for. Five, another thing to be aware of, biases. Um, you could spend easily a whole class just on biases. This is a model of different types of biases. There's almost 200 of them there, categorized and subcategorized. We'll talk just about uh, what five of them might be that you, you may find fairly often uh, in the critical thinking process. So one of them is confirmation bias. Uh, this is, means I see what agrees with what I'm looking for, what, what I want to see. So um, um, I, I, uh, I, I, uh, I'm a conservative politician and I only look for those facts. I'm a liberal politician and I only look for those facts and ignore the rest. Anchoring bias is the problem of, it, it's, 
if you start with one assumption or one fact and then just look at the facts that flow from that or that related to that and don't look laterally at other things that might be affecting your situation so you're you're too literal or too linear in your thinking information bias is the problem of not being selective about what information uh, we're dealing with or being overly detailed so it's it's sometimes the felony to look further look further look further when in fact you have uh, sufficient information to move forward with your conclusions authority bias is um, the, 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 the tendency to um, if someone has uh, if someone's an important person then we're tending to believe what they have to say or if they're an external authority sometimes we're tending to believe what they say or if they're an algorithm for, algorithmic formula we might believe what they have to say uh, and it's not that we should disrespect any of those things it's just that we should make sure and as we're internally processing it if you think of the gear picture right uh, we've got all the information we're internally processing it we're, we want to make sure we're being objective about what those biases are and collective bias is the, uh, the, the sense that we have no dissent, everybody in the room, no one's disagreeing, so we must be correct. The truth is the people in the room have done their best job, but there still could be something uh, yet to test outside of the room. A great example of this might be uh, you know, product development and the idea that we design a product in a, in a, uh, in a closed environment, uh, we take it out to the market, and lo and behold, the, the collective bias was, it, was uh, uh, and it was snuck in and we didn't uh, actually, we weren't right. Uh, so last two points um, uh, are some, some techniques that we can use. Um, and one of them is uh, called lateral thinking. And this is based on uh, a gentleman named Edward de Bono's thinking system. He coined the term lateral thinking. And he was a, uh, some of you, if you don't know, uh, was uh, one of the, you know, early definers of um, the creative uh, problem solving process and a, and a big guru on creativity and innovation. And so he, he has a, a, a technique that he calls the uh, six thinking hats. And it's kind of a goofy uh, name. Uh, so please kind of don't discount it because it has a goofy name. Uh, no, but uh, it, it really is a great concept in the sense that um, uh, the, the, the typical uh, habit that we have is that if someone makes a point, somebody else makes a counterpoint. Or if someone makes a point, someone kind of tends, it, it sparks another idea and somebody else and that person makes a point that's almost unrelated. And so you get um, a whole mix of things that people can't process. And so Bono, the Bono's thinking system asks you to uh, kind of put that habit aside and in, instead of build another one use kind of an improv habit where you kind of uh, take one of his six uh, domains so his six, six thinking hats and you say let's stay in this domain and let's follow this out to conclusion and get all the ideas in this domain out before we distract ourselves with a counter argument or a, a, a kind of tangential related argument. And so part of it is to keep people focused on the domain of the thinking, which is very handy. But part of it is also to make sure that you follow all six of the domains. Because sometimes well, the white hat, for example, is uh, kind of the hat about facts. And uh, uh, you, know, you can think of it as a white paper. It's very analytical. These are the things that most analytical folks stick to. The financial people say it's a real fact if it's this concrete, right? Mm -hmm. um, so that's all healthy. So stick with those concrete facts. What do you actually know that you have some evidence of? And let's get all of that piece off. Let's stay in that domain. And then let's go to another one. And he'll, the red hat, he'll say, is the hat about emotion or intuition. And so th this is saying, well, how does this, how do you react to this at a gut level? How does this make you feel? And uh, it's not because you, you want to hold hands and and, and uh, sing kumbaya, you know, that type of thing. But uh, it's, it's, the, it's based on the, the belief and the experience that people's emotional reactions is actually information and people's intuition is actually kind of pre-information, right? So let's, instead of shutting that down, because people's instincts when you're on the wrong track or something like that or, or right track, uh, it, it's important to get that out, uh, both from an information gathering standpoint but it also tells you a lot about your room and whether they're really on board and what kind of reaction you're gonna get uh, after the decision is made. So it's really an important 
domain. So quickly, the others are uh, yellow, which is okay. Let's what's the best that could happen? What's 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 the best part about this? What do we like about this idea? And then green is um, well, what could this lead to? It's like well, this could be the start of something that grows from here, right? So if we do this, it has the other advantages of growing these other ways. So lots of times in discussions, people talk about, you know, short-term return on investment versus like strategic value, right? The green stuff is the back potential. It's important to get that out and make that part of the conversation. Now, black is the kind of the, the, the judge, the critic, what could go wrong? What's the risk, right? That's a great discussion to have. And blue is kind of like, the, the wise person uh, stepping back and saying, you know, it's it's really meta about the process is how is this process working? Is this process uh, getting us what's necessary and sufficient? Are we coming up with something that's actionable, that uh, an argument that would be critical? So those are the hats. Um, we easily could spend a whole class on understanding them better and practice using them and practice redirecting the team so that they can kind of use this to keep on focus. Uh, be great to do that. So now the next one is very similar and maybe more familiar to you. This is uh, the fishbone diagram or root cause analysis. It's the same idea of looking at domains, but in this case, it's it's not the same domains as the hats. It's it's more a systemic look. So what's the system that's giving us our results? Because the structure of the system, uh, our systems thinking. Uh, that uh, if you're a physicist uh, you, or an engineer, you know that the structure is going to determine what the what the outcome is going to be. So you want to make sure that your analysis is covering all those structural elements. So people, process, technology, uh, culture, machines, materials, whatever they are on your fish bones. Uh, that's an excellent way to lead the process, much like you did with the hats. And in fact, you can use these in combination because say you want to look at the people fishbone um, uh, uh, for the root cause analysis. You can use the hats to say, well, what are the things we know, the white hats about the people thing? What's our emotion telling us? What's our instinct or intuition telling us about what's going on here? And you can kind of see through all those domains. So using, using the hats domains to help make sure that you're getting all the perspectives on the fishbone diagram, excellence in the technique for the whole of critical thinking as a process. So this brings us to um, really our, our final completed puzzle. So we've got words to align us with, with, you know, with what critical thinking is. We have value, immediate value, and the, the, the challenge to meet the capacity of growing challenges. Uh, we have process, this dual processes. We have steps that we can take, uh, you know, beginning, middle, end, uh, input, process, output, right? And uh, the organic piece of it of, of, of using all those capabilities that those, the Stanford people and the other people came up with is, let's use these in whatever order makes sense. We have mindsets to hold on to to keep the process healthy. We have some things to know like biases and necessary and sufficient concepts that we can use to make sure that we're, we're glued together as a team and then we've got the, the, the critical thinking process going well and we have a few tools to use that are helpful in maybe more complicated or formal situations and so I hope with that uh, what you come away with is again that um, critical thinking is a high order capability which means it's multi-dimensional it's complex enough that we uh, we, we, we can't learn one thing and say we know it. There's a whole combination of things that we have to learn. We have to learn how those all fit together, and then we have to be able to uh, process them, right? So it's a high order thinking. Uh, th 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 they're complex and interrelated uh, capabilities, and that complex and interrelated capabilities require time and experience to assimilate them. And so it follows that I should have a strategy over time to build and sustain these skills. And that's my wish for all of you, as well as my exhortation. So with that, uh, Kelly and uh, Kara, I turn it back to you. Thank you so much, Tom. And thanks again, everyone, for joining us today. If you guys have any questions, we'll stay on the line for a little bit and feel free to ask those now. Um, in the meantime, I wanted to let everyone know that the present, a copy of the presentation will be sent out to you all um, later today or first thing tomorrow so that you can review anything you may have missed. Also wanted to point you guys to our website at newhorizons.com. There you can find all of our updated class information on uh, any upcoming uh, leadership and development 
courses that are coming up. So visit our website at newhorizons.com and just click on the Center for Leadership and Development and you will see all of our available course offerings there. You can also click on the webinars link to see a full list of upcoming sessions and past webinars, webinar recordings available in our archive library. These are free for you guys to all uh, view and attend. So I really hope you'll join us for future sessions as well. All right, I think we can go ahead and wrap things up. So Tom, thank you so much for your time today and uh, joining us and speaking on behalf of New Horizons. Thank you. And thanks again, everyone, for joining us today. I hope you all enjoyed today's session. Uh, that will conclude today's session. You may now log off. Have a great day, everyone.